All right, hello and welcome. My name is Natalie Raymond and I am the Digital Program Coordinator of Dataversity. We would love to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Data at the Speed of Business with Data Mastering and Governance, sponsored by Informatica. Just a couple of housekeeping points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send only to panelists, but you may absolutely change it in order to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click on those icons found in the bottom center of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now I'm happy to introduce you to our speakers for today, Jason Beard, Ryan Glazenow, Jay Hawkinson, and Taryn Stebbins. Jason is the Senior Director of Data Strategy and Governance at Informatica. With over 25 years of data industry practitioner and consulting experience, Jason is a hands-on strategist, data governance expert, and change leader with experience spanning the business and technology domains. He has led enterprise programs, transformation initiatives, and operational teams in a variety of industries, including research and educational publishing, consumer packaged goods, banking, investments, and insurance. Ryan joined Informatica in 2018, where he came over as a customer using Informatica's MDM, DQ, and data governance solutions. He is a leader for the data governance solution specialist team in North America, helping to support other data management practitioners operationalize their data strategy and showing the value of how data governance can help accelerate an organization's business transformation. Jay is the Director of Data Analytics and Insights at Valmont Industries. He is a change agent who builds high-performing te technology teams to make game-changing differences in organizations. His broad-based business background has been fueling change through people, processes, and technology. Utilizing a strategic approach to resolving business challenges, Jay has maximized IT value by improving business processes, reducing IT spending by over 25%, and delivering gains in client satisfaction of up to 83%. Last but not least, Taryn is the Director of Data Strategy and Master Data Management with Fragomen. With 20 years experience building data management frameworks that enable enterprise-wide data governance, Taryn is a highly accomplished data leader with expertise in strategic planning, data management architecture, and continuous improvement. She brings a proven ability to deliver both high-level and fine-grade insight into enterprise operations. And with that, I am happy to give the floor over to our esteemed panel to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Natalie. So welcome to our uh, panel discussion today around data at the speed of business with data with data mastering and governance. Um, appreciate the introductions, um, Natalie. I want to give a little bit of um, background about Informatica real quick. Uh, where we have a, a new theme talking about where data comes to life. And this is because Informatica is a leader in enterprise cloud data management. We're empowering businesses to realize the transformative power of bringing their data to life. And we've created a whole new category of software, which is the Informatica Intelligent Data Management Cloud, which is powered by AI and an end-to-end -end data management platform, which connects and unifies uh, all of the data. Before we dive in, again, just want to introduce myself. I'll pass it over to Jason as well as to Jay and, and to Taryn. But Ryan Glass, now I'm the senior director for our data governance field sales here at Informatica. Jason. Hi, everyone. Jason Beard. I'm the senior director for data strategy and governance in our advisory services practice at Informatica. Over to Jay. Hi there, I'm Jay Hawkinson, the Director of Data and Analytics at Valmont uh, Industries. Valmont is a global manufacturer uh, doing lots of stuff in all sorts of areas, especially in the irrigation and agriculture space and infrastructure like the tra uh, traffic and lighting and other pieces. Uh, I came on two years ago to Valmont to try to build out their uh, data piece uh, so that we could really go on a really good data digital transformation and uh, so far, we've had some great success.
Hi, I'm Taryn Stebbins. I'm with Fragonin, and we are the world's leader of immigration services and support with over 60 locations worldwide. And we leverage all of our immigration experience to offer all of our clients anything that they need from an immigration and mobility perspective. We are currently going through a digital transformation for the firm and also a need for data standardization and improvement of data quality. So we are leveraging technologies like Informatica and Master Data Management to start to launch that initiative. Perfect, thank you, Taryn. Excellent. Okay, this is Jason. I'm gonna get us started with just a little bit of context setting first around the topic for today. Uh, data is the lifeblood of every modern business. Uh, with so many capabilities available though in the data space, it's easy sometimes to forget why we're doing it. Um, and building a great platform is pointless unless you do so in the interest of, of directly addressing real business problems. So just talking a little bit about some of the kinds of business issues that we commonly see from customers, particularly in the master data and data governance space, growing the business and increasing agility, making it easier to find, understand, trust, and access data uh, for today's use in applications, um, overall a reduced time to value for data, improving customer experience uh, through data intelligence that makes your business smarter when you can understand your customers and all of their needs, um, having an awareness across their household, an awareness of claims activity if you're in the insurance business, um, understanding your customer from many perspectives uh, and across the entire value stream uh, in which they operate with your business. Of course, reducing operational costs, enabling greater efficiencies, less time wasted, searching for answers, um, exposing relevant data to your organization. Um, a great example of one of Informatica's healthcare clients, which was able to reduce their data onboarding costs by $10 million um, through greater leveraging of these kinds of platform technologies. And of course, managing risk and compliance to ensure that data-driven business initiatives are aligned, not only with what you're trying to achieve as a business, but broader industry government mandates, uh, protecting privacy uh, for your customers. However, we know that uh, with high-performing organizations uh, that are focused on data delivery, sometimes uh, there can be, oh, next one, Ryan, please. I think we've got a extra slide. There we go. Thank you. Um, it's important to be thinking about what are the right questions to ask um, as we get into solving some of those business problems. Um, it really comes down to how do we understand the data? How is data defined? Uh, where do we find uh, full compliance requirements about the data? What's, what's actually required for us to achieve within that? Uh, how is data classified? being able to find information that's relevant to the topic that you're talking about, uh, cataloging that information, making it available to a broad cross-section of your business, governing data. How do I know who, who is responsible for this information? Uh, we Listen, we all live in, in corporate environments where it's sometimes hard to understand uh, who is the who is the vetter of this information, who's really got uh, the best understanding, who owns this information, who's responsible, accountable for its quality, for setting the rules around it. So governing that information to ensure that we've got that kind of visibility, ultimately mastering the data to make sure that when we have 15 versions of, uh, of Jane Smith in a system, uh, we know which one of those 15 uh, are actually the same person and which ones are not. Um, so simple things around uh, obviously uh, mastering customer product, uh, but also supplier, vendor, uh, uh, employee information, location information, a whole raft of reference data that is really um, at the heart of a lot of what uh, businesses rely upon to operate. And of course, ultimately measuring uh, your information, understanding how that data looks quality wise and being able to ensure that it's available and trusted um, as the desirable outcome. Over to you, Ryan. Perfect. I think we're actually ready oh. for our first um, discussion. Yes, and I think uh, where we wanted to start today with thinking about these business imperatives that we just talked about is what are your business imperatives? So when we talk about uh, things like faster time to value for information, we talk about improving customer experience. What are the business problems that that uh, you guys are trying to solve? So I thought we'd start, Taryn, with you maybe kicking us off with what some of the business imperatives are around, around Fragman's business that, that are driving your data initiative. Yes, um, so what I kind of mentioned at the onset, one of the key things that we're trying to um, do is a digital transformation. So we see a need for 
managing data, especially master data to enable uh, digital transformation so that that can support their growth and um, also you know, increase their agility to offer more services or products. But as we've been taking this journey, we have seen several of the other three that have popped up around improving that customer experience because we are having some quality issues, having um, fragmented systems and fragmented uh, processes around uh, our current master data and bringing that together with Informatica is helping to improve that customer experience. And then also um, there's a lot of manual efforts uh, around uh, managing our information, our client data. And so we're starting to see uh, you know, less of a need of um, people to keep you know, uh, the business as usual or keep in the client quality data up and running. So we're starting to see a reduction in operational costs. And then of course there is, you know, managing that risk and compliance. You know, we have a reputational risk that we see as far as, you know, improving our data quality within the, um, for our customers, but also making sure that we're in compliance with some of the government regulations we have as well. Fantastic, thank you, Taryn. Jay, uh, maybe just a couple of thoughts from you as well on, on what are some of the key business initiatives driving Valmont's uh, data initiative? Uh, just about everything. So for <laughs> <laughs> when I was started, it was mainly about getting access to data. And once we addressed the access problem, we ran into all the others. Um, no one was really trusting the data that was coming aboard. No one knew where the data they needed to get to was. Uh, and I did a lot of work and focusing on how to do it. My challenge is a little bit different as in I'm being asked to solve all these things all at the same time as I'm trying to explain to people how to build the house, how you have to start from the bottom up. But from business imperatives, a lot of it comes down to that digital transformation, being able to get it so that we can take all the silos we have throughout the organization and be able to address them quicker and easier. Uh, as well as the digital transformation of trying to eventually uh, consolidate our systems into strategic platforms to go across. But at the same time as all that is going on, increasing the time to insights or reducing the time to insights for our people across the board. Excellent. And those are all, all the items that both you and Taryn have mentioned are, are topics that we hear about quite often. The big challenge, of course, in organizing to solve those problems is how do you collaborate across your organization? Um, uh, understanding what the business problem is, uh, what you think you need to do to solve it is part of the puzzle. Getting engagement across the business is the other part. Um, so maybe Taryn, back to you. How have you approached addressing that, that issue? So when we kicked off the master data management project, we didn't start with the technology. We started with the processes and the, at first, <laughs> so we can you know, <laughs> to, to Jay's, um, uh, you know, uh, what he was mentioning for their digital transformation. Because if we started with the processes, then we can kind of understand what data is needed within those processes. So we laid out what we call the life cycle of client services, and we focused in on a, in a, on a couple of those uh, life cycle steps and contained the processes to start our master data management journey. And that helped to kind of contain some of the um, scope creep in a sense, even though that it's continuing to add, and, and similar to Jay, uh, we kind of uncovered every day that we work on this initiative and this, this program, lots of things keep popping up as, you know, uh, you know, kind of, I wouldn't call them data issues, but just, hey, can you fix this? Can it do this? Can it fix this? Because they're starting to see the value immediately without us even being in production of what the, uh, the uh, master data management program, along with the enabling technology of Informatica can do. Fantastic. Jay, anything to add uh, to those ideas? Oh, absolutely. I mean, part of the problem is that we ran into is, again, as soon as we solve things like the data access problem, now you get a whole new series of problems to solve. It's always snowballing. Mm -hmm. Collaboration on us is a little bit, was is one of our challenges. Uh, Valmont grew by very much independent entrepreneurial spirits within all the different divisions. And when we acquired companies, we acquired them and didn't do very much with them except try to find more ways for us to work together. Certainly did not consolidate data or processes across the board. 
So one of the things that I've been doing is working with people when they're ready. One of the important things for me is looking throughout my organization when the organizations are asking the right questions. I can't do it big bang. I was told by the CEO first step, oh, I don't want this data uh, governance stuff. Uh, just use AI and ML to do it for us. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, but what I've been doing is working with like right now, we've got it with the finance department. The finance department's finally asking all the right questions and realizing the challenges with quality and all the pieces. So now I'm able to get a group that I can apply that governance to. And we've been very successful very quickly by doing it that way. Excellent. I love that idea of, you know, meeting the people where they are and really building that coalition of the willing, um, you know, that are willing to, to get in and help to solve those problems, be early adopters of some of the program methodology and, and techniques that you're describing. And Taryn, back to your comment about uh, having to balance what I'll call the run and the build aspects of rolling out a program like this. Uh, as you start seeing uh, the problems accumulate, people come to the table with issues they want resolved. You're also trying to build a broader capability um, and in some sense, trying to, to change the uh, the tires of the car while you're driving down the road. So a, a great governance structure is important to, to kind of managing all of that um, and having some sense of how you're going to prioritize the issues that come up. I'd be curious uh, what your thoughts are on how you've approached that kind of uh, that kind of overall governance of your programs. Who would like to start? Well, I can start a little bit. Sure. Um, so similar to Jay, you know, we've been kind of doing what we call an informal coalition of people. I think to kind of paraphrase some of your words. Mm -hmm. And um, what we've been taking to our senior uh, leaders, um, our executives, is that we need to make this a little bit more formalized. So then that way we can have, you know, decisions and authority against, um, you know, these, how do we remediate some of these issues and make them more preventative? Um, again, you know, as you keep going on these journeys of this uh, data management program or this master data management program, you start to see these little things trickle in, but there's, you know, we want to make sure that things are standardized, that they are decision by a governing body with authority, with decisions made, um, and then we can make those happen in working with our partners within technology and with the operations as well. I'm analyzing what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. So from my side, the what we've been doing is building out that governance uh, to the point of with the willing, but it's expanding past that very, very quickly as we look at a digital transformation. So if you take a record like that, we're working right now on our customer record. Well, finance doesn't own the customer record. They own part of it, of course, mm -hmm. but they don't own the whole thing. So we've been using that to build out that larger governance structure where I have steering committees within commercial engineering, finance, and operations. And in these cases, we're working together at that larger team level. I'm trying to avoid a top level data group only because I have an executive leadership team that's very engaged and can act in that role for giving me high level mm -hmm. priorities. But at that lower level, I need people who are actually going to uh, work together. And for me, that I can do it by using those individual steering committees working together to solve an individual piece for our digital transformation. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, it's it's, uh, it's sometimes the, the third rail of data governance is uh, starting with uh, those data elements and data attributes where they are shared and used across multiple groups can sometimes get mired down in uh, disagreement about that um, and slow progress, but it sounds like you found a good way um, to really hone in on some of the some of the fields, some of the pieces of data that that will make a difference to multiple parts of the business, and you've got a good way to for them to work together. So, um, kudos to that. And, um, and sorry, just to kind of um, you know similar yeah, to what Jay was saying, you know, from a top down perspective, we just want to have kind of decisions made. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have a level of governance, what we call working groups that span across those cross-functional teams. Similar to what Jay was saying is that we, we take the customer, um, you know, uh, some people kind of feel like they own that definition of the customer, but what they only own is what their fit for purpose needs are. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we are developing those kind of what we call client working, data working groups so that we bring all the cross-functional owners of that record, that client record, to make sure that we have appropriate standardization and so we can bring it up to a level of decision-making. Yep. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like you've both uh, done a great job getting the, getting the people organized, which is sometimes the hardest part of these programs. 
um, and having a way to identify those priorities and, and move things forward and, and find some real value. So uh, congratulations on that success. I think at this point in time, we're going to flip to our next slide and talk a little bit about some of the challenges to governing master data. Ryan, over to you. Yeah, real quick, I, I wanted to circle back on one of the things. Oh, sure, um, please. Jay, Jay, that you said when you know you talked about you know when they're ready or when they're willing. Things that I've seen organizations also be successful in that is helping to go ahead and almost have your own little you know PR system that that's in place. Going out there, keeping people educated, even though they might not be actively participating, because that's going to help accelerate them and, and they're being able to see the successes in which these governance organizations are, are, are bringing to the table um, and make them much more willing and, and wanting to participate um, down the road. <clears throat> so I really like that. Yeah, I, and but, we're doing that with our part of what we'll call our data literacy program goes into that aspect of it, of publishing the stuff that we're doing, having them see what's going on in the other parts and the successes uh, to that point. It's been very successful for what I'm doing, as well as the work we're doing on our data science and more innovative technologies. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for that. Um, but let's let's pivot real quick uh, into the, the challenges on mastering or challenges to governing uh, master data. We're gonna go ahead and, and talk about um, three key topics within here um, and really why it's hard to, to govern. And, and again, we'll have um, Taryn and, and Jay um, discuss uh, this. But the first one is gonna be around identifying unknown data sources. Really, it starts at the source and data governance should be there to help you find what you don't know across your organization, right? Do you want your data mastering team spending all of this time searching for data or improving its accuracy? And there's obviously an opportunity cost to the time that's being spent in this space. So the first challenge overall as part of the discussion is, um, you know, often the starting point for data governance. How does identifying data sources in the, in the data types create this different challenge for your organization. And so, Taryn, Jay, if one of you wanna um, go ahead and, and kind of take that, um, that first question and, and really, you know, where do teams, where were you seeing teams spend a lot of time hunting for data and really less time being productive? I know, Jay, you talked about, you know, access being one of those first things um, that, that you were focused on. Absolutely, this is one of our core challenges or where it was. In the past, we spent over 85% of all our data science and analytics initiatives, just finding the data and knowing how to use it. It slowed down value attainment. And in all honesty, the business teams quickly got bored with it and uh, just went back to the old manual processes. So everybody's team got, uh, or time got wasted. It also added a huge risk with it incorrect identification and a lot of rework being done within my own team because they would be doing something, give it up to the business, the business would say, yeah, that's wrong. And that would be just about the level of the conversation that we had. So we found that this is an important aspect for what we need to do. I, For us, we, got, we have to do it, we have to do it right to reduce the risk and get those fruits that we need in the AI and ML level. And the way I've been doing a lot of this is by building it as part of our muscle. Every time that we start a new data project, we start with this, is identifying the data sources, typing, using a data catalog solution to try to get this information all together. So we do it, look and find it once, and then share it for everybody. So um, for uh, us uh, in our master data management program, um, identifying our data sources was our initial challenge. Um, like I described earlier, we laid out what we call our lifecycle client services and associated the, the key technologies that supported it of, so we could identify our data sources. That was um, kind of a, a, a challenge at the beginning because we were going back to the system on record and then working with the team members that represented that system of record, but they didn't know how to, to provide that data. So we had to go turn to our analytics team um, to be able to get to our key data sets for um, identifying our data sources so that we can profile it appropriately and kind of understanding what our state of, uh, the state of the data was. Um, and it, it significantly improved our speed to market once we got past that point. 
Um, but um, I, I agree with Jay, you know, from some past experience, not with our current, my current firm and stuff is that when you have um, data sets that are, are trusted and kind of that source of truth, it helps everything to go a little bit easier and faster and quicker. Um, you know, this is opportunities that we see for improvement across our certain um, system of records um, to make sure that we have those key data sets coming from our system of records that are, you know, trusted so that we can continue to mature our data and also our analytics as well. Yeah, and this is this is something that we see with an organization, right? They just want to understand what data do we even have that's that's out there. And when you're able to go ahead and identify that data and, and scan it, right, and bring the lineage in, it's just this big aha moment that organizations are having and where they're able to see where data is coming from and, and going to the data quality, uh, Taryn, that you mentioned uh, around that. So um, it definitely um, is, is, a, is a great starting point that uh, people are coming in um, yeah. to identify that data. I would say that, Ryan, it's a challenge for us too. And, you know, I know we're specifically speaking to like master data, but we're leveraging some of the other capabilities within our um, software as a service uh, regarding data cataloging and um, metadata collection. So that way we can see beyond just the master data, where else is data residing? Um, where is it sourced from? And start to deploy standardization of like authoritative data sources of this information as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's let's go on to the uh, to the second uh, challenge here, um, Jason. Sure. Yeah, happy to kick us off here. So the second challenge, uh, one that I know we can all relate to, uh, has to do with improving low trust in data accuracy. And you know, we talked before about uh, what is the point of governance. Well, one uh, increase availability, visibility, but certainly uh, right alongside that has to be creating trust and in information. We all still know that so much time is spent trying to uh, to establish that trust um, at an individual level. And at the end of the day, do you really trust the, the number that you get out of a system or do you always go back and verify it? So trying to shorten that cycle to where people can really believe in the information they're seeing. Some interesting numbers here, only 27% of data practitioners completely trust their data. Um, that's uh, from an IDC survey, um, and I would argue that uh, that 27% probably don't always know as much as they think they know about their data. Uh, the second point here, trust in data degrades as it moves further away from the origin. Um, it's absolutely true. Uh, we all know the the kind of stories about, uh, I believe what's in uh, my ERP system, I believe what's in my CRM system, I believe what's in my manufacturing system. Uh, but when it goes to that data warehouse or that data lake, or it goes into the black box of you know a corporate data platform, um, I start to lose confidence. I don't know what happened to that data on its way to those places. Um, so creating that visibility and creating that trust, a really important piece of it. Um, ultimately, uh, those source systems can operate as flexibly and as integrated a way as modern data uh, provisioning requires. Um, and so we have to establish that trust in order to get the analytical value of, of what we're doing. Um, and finally, uh, rigid manual documentation based approaches do not scale. Um, we've got thousands of data sources. You know, Informatica has customers with uh, tens of thousands of data sources that are being scanned and assets that are being scanned. Um, there's more data out there than ever. Humans can't keep up with it. So it's really important that there be a, a process in place and visibility to create that trust that doesn't require on uh, poor data stewards kind of sitting there cranking out Excel spreadsheets day after day uh, or updating those based on changes in the data environment. Uh, so let's uh, move to the next slide here. Just talk a little bit about this key question. How do we improve low trust in data accuracy? Uh, Jay, would you like to kick us off and, and maybe talk a little bit about how you've approached the, the concept of trust um, and and creating that that trust within your your business user population. Sure. About two years ago, when I started, the data access, as I said, was the big problem. As soon as I gave people access, quality and trust became the issue. Part of the problem was forever we did things by consolidating things in Excel spreadsheets, so people trusted the result because they trusted the person who was doing it. Well. I'm trying to get rid of that person. Well, not get rid of them. I want them doing something else, <laughs> not being manually transforming this data. And this became a bi big issue for people to see. We've, we've done this in a number of ways. First of all, we do have some core problems that we have to solve. And we're doing that with the work that we're doing in master data and data quality and getting people to understand 
uh, what bad data really means, that it's just not uh, accuracy, it's not just missing, it's a whole bunch of criteria they have to work with. So we're using data quality, we do use the data, liter uh, the data lineage quite a bit to show people where that data is coming from and where it's all being transformed. That works really, really well for our analysts and our data scientists. For our leaders and managers, not so much because they have no idea what's on the other end of that box. Okay. But I, we do that by the stuff that we're talking about now, trying to get around the problems that they have and problems that their people are having with when they were transforming that data even manually and targeting them on our data quality initiatives. Excellent. A good approach. Um, and I love that idea about uh, really focusing on the different personas and populations that you have to appeal to there. Um, it's not a one size fits all. So I think that's a really powerful point. Taryn, can you talk a little bit about, about your experience with trying to create trust in your data within your data governance program? Uh, yes. So when we were beginning our master data management journey, we did, you know, the typical profiling of the data to assess the quality that we were about to bring, uh, uh, bring into um, our uh, MDM tool. And it was really interesting how um, team members who have been working within, you know, their system of records, right, their systems, you know, thought, oh, you know, we've been keeping on top of this. We've really been improving the quality. And then when they saw it as an outcome, they're like, oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we didn't, you know, because there was limitations at the system level in order to put controls into place to prevent them from um, uh, going past the screen without filling in a field or making sure things are mandatory beyond the asterisk, right? Like this is a mandatory field. And so, um, you know, people are starting to say, now they're starting to use that language, oh, we need to improve the data quality, or um, not only do we need to look at completeness, we also need to look at accuracy of this information as well. So people are starting to use that vocabulary, and it is one of our, our next phases of our program is start to educate across the firm as well. So people, you know, not just among a core team that, you know, are within certain processes, it's, it's a language that's used across the entire firm as well. That's awesome. Uh, and I think that's that's where everyone's trying to get to for sure. And listening to both of you talk about uh, trust in data, it occurs to me, data is uh, often used uh, euphemistically to describe both the data itself, but of course the reports that represent that data as well. What we often find is that uh, there's just as much, if not more confusion um, at the reporting layer um, as there is at the data layer. So what am I looking at? Do I trust it? Do I understand what it's telling me in this report? Even if I believed the underlying data was correct, is this representation of it accurate? So governing reporting and analytical outputs is a key piece of this as well. Can you guys talk a little bit about your experience there, Jay? Absolutely. You, you have it right on. We, we came from an environment which used to allow everyone to do every reporting that they wanted, however they wanted to. And we ran into the exact situation you'd expect. We had over 4,000 reports that uh, no one knew what was right, what was wrong, or how to do it. Then they decided to fix the problem by moving to an SSRS environment, whereupon they, of course, lifted and shifted everything that was in the old environment into an SSRS report and recreated the same thing in a new place. Um, so that's one of the areas that we're focusing on quite a bit on how we're having that communication, how we have to tie everything that we're doing from an analytics platform into things like the data catalog, how we have to give this information so that everyone sees and can understand where the pieces are and to try to document all the important pieces. I think a good point that was brought up before was you can only do so much. There is so much data coming at us and you have to really pay attention to the most important elements that are coming, not, not to everything all at once. And uh, we've been finding that very, very effective to get people to really, really focus on what's the thing that really changes. The biggest challenge I have is getting people to stop thinking about it as magic. Somehow people think that data quality is, some, is just something magically that happens. Oh, it's an ERP system. It's going to be good quality. Yeah, no, that ain't the case. And that literacy conversation, getting them to understand that the asset is important and understand why it's important that a currency has to be USD or US, but not both uh, at the same time. And what that implies to the rest of it is, is something that's coming to the, to the forefront now for people to truly understand 
in, in the analytical side and they understand how hard it is for them to get good analysis if they haven't done the work they needed to in the earlier parts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jay, I, like what you, I like what you said there, Jay, around you know data quality is not magic. And this is something I was just talking about with the, with the panel last week in, in New York, you know, around how important it is to go ahead and fix the root cause, which is typically the business user, right? They're the ones that are putting the data into the system, but it's fixing the root cause, not necessarily diagnosing the symptom, which would be that magic that you're talking about uh, on the back end. Yeah, and there's lots of things that we can do. I mean, if you go, uh, one of our challenges was that the ERP systems never had the lockdown that they should have on required fields and rules that should have been applied to it in the first place. So there is stuff that has to happen. And the good thing is, as you start analyzing this, as you start looking at the data and figuring out what the business rules and defining what good data is versus bad data and what has to happen, that can give you a roadmap, both technically as well as for those end users, as well as what do you do to fix it and keep it clean in the uh, as you go into the future. So Jay, I wanted to tell you when you were talking about the reports, we used to call that the wild, wild west. In yeah. The world. yeah, we started me. Um, <laughs> so um, when it comes to, I mean, just kind of an approach of what we've just done with the master data management project um, in just in data management practices is we always start off with the business term, the name. The name should give an indication of what it is, right? And the definition should give the rest of the information. So I think before Jason was asking about, have you ever had challenges where people, you know, think they're looking at one data, you know, element or data attribute and it's something completely different. And this came up with some conversations we've had with, with our leadership was that, oh, I asked a team for XYZ metric and I got it. And then I looked at a report and it was different than what I got. And they go, well, there's two definitions, right? right. And so, yeah. So, so one of the key things are, you know, is it, you know, especially since we're a global uh, firm, right? And, and lots of people is to again educate them that there's something about a name. There's something about how we name something, right? And making sure that's following a standard for that. So then that way, the the, the name is long lasting. It's unambiguous. It's meaningful and that people look at it and they can tell what it is. And then plus looking at the definition to verify it. So that's what we would start with, with master data and along with what Jay commented on, what are the business rules to those data elements that we can then plug into um, the, uh, in, in our technology or also within our operations as well to improve the quality. Absolutely. And this conversation reminds me a little bit of uh, in my past life, uh, before I came to Informatica, I was an Informatica customer, uh, like Ryan, and so uh, lived in the trenches of the kind of stuff that uh, UJ and Taryn are talking about with uh, trying to resolve these kinds of uh, endemic corporate problems uh, that are woven in over many years and decades um, into behaviors, right? And uh, how do you solve the problem of, of changing uh, the use of a terminology around a piece of master data, something as simple as customer uh, or product, um, and always creating that context awareness when you're showing it on a report so that people know what, what flavor of that you're talking about. As an example, in my past life, I led a governance program at a major publisher. Uh, and in that context, uh, we would talk about customers, but they could be many different things. Sometimes they were partners. Sometimes they were individual purchasers. Sometimes they were actually partners uh, that were providing content uh, into our into our product lines. Um, and so understanding the context in which you're talking about a piece of master data is important and, and differentiating it. Do you guys have any examples like that where you've had to go a level down within some of those key master data concepts um, to really tease that out at a, at a greater level of granularity? And, and how have you enforced that in your environment? Yes, absolutely. People are like, oh, that's master data. That's master data. It's like, no, you're describing event data, right? And so right. We, we definitely kind of start off when we um, do our socialization of the program and the initiative, we kind of give everybody a, a background to what master data is and what master data is not. So that, that way they can put in their mind and kind of promoting that literacy of, of that concept. So mm -hmm. that they can make sure hey, it's, it's slow changing. It doesn't change a lot. Now, if it's something that's happening every minute of the day or daily, that's most likely an event data, right? That we can categorize mm -hmm. appropriately. 
in the right sort of like subject area or domain of data. Perfect. Absolutely. Let's, yeah, great. Let, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, let's go ahead and move on to, uh, to our next um, uh, topic here, which is really more around uh, enabling the, the responsible data use. Um, you know, Taryn, you mentioned something kind of earlier around this as well, um, right? And I think that really resonates with the um, first bullet up there around 33% of customers believe that personal data is being used responsibly, right? You, you talked really about, you know, you guys have a reputation that you need to be able to uh, uphold um, as, a, as a part of your, your organization. Um, so when we look at enabling responsible data use, um, it's again, this is really kind of the last uh, key challenge, but it plays a huge part around, you know, enforcing policies and standards. How would you describe your, your data consumers uh, or do they question whether, um, you know, the, the data is, is accurate and, and reliable and that they should have the appropriate access to that? So, um, I think the thing is, is that, you know, I think with this, the program, I think they're seeing that the, there's, we're starting to kind of scale up and mature the reliability and the accuracy of the data. Um, and the, our data consumers, which are right now systems, um, I think the next phase is we're going to be adding to our analytics space, you know, so that way they can trust that. Of course, they're already pulling from their system of records, so it, it should be, you know, pushing through that they, they are definitely, you know, starting to see the value of, you know, improving the, the, um, the completeness and the accuracy of the data. Our, our uh, data privacy team sees so what data is, you know, um, from a privacy perspective, you know, what it's classified as, and we worked hand in hand. So they, they see it very clearly, and it starts uh, going back to the last uh, subject we were talking about is, it starts at that business term, so that they can see the business term, they can see the definition, they can understand the profile of information and they can say, yeah, that's sensitive PII or it's general PII, et cetera. So we're able to kind of have a conversation more at the data level and not so much the system level. And knowing that the data does tie to systems, then you can have that, that relationship between those two things. It, you know, it, it makes it easier to govern and control and, and act responsibility, responsible with the data. Yeah, from our side, the uh, we're sort of the flip. We're our data consumer is more on the analytics than it is on the system right now. Uh, I, I see us going down the flip journey of it. I, I, I'm helping out the other guys that are doing the integration side of it. It all feed the same thing. But for us, the there is always that question on the accuracy and reliability, uh, mainly because in the past it didn't matter to them. Uh, their numbers were what their numbers were. They they believed it because it was being funneled through a person who would say, yeah, that's right, or no, that's not right. Uh, but as we get more and more automated, there's more and more questions on the accuracy, as I stated before, but also the reliability and getting that data in their hands at the same time every day, all the time, becomes much more of a pieces, uh, much more of a um, um, something that has to happen. So enabling it for responsible data use, most of the time we have not had too much problem in this space, mainly because we don't have very much data that would, could be misused. Uh, we don't have that much personal data because for manufacturers, it's mostly uh, the data that is co company focused, uh, but we have seen and have educated people on what you cannot, can and cannot do. We had a marketing team who wanted to make a blast to everybody who ever bought or all, ever saw our website on this one thing. And we said, yeah, you're finding spam for us. Thank you very much. Uh, but it's been a rare thing for it. The data is perceived as a potential liability for us actually because of liability. One of the challenges is, is our amount of data that we have, and more to the point of the uh, relevance of the data, if you will. I was looking at one of our systems yesterday that has accounts payable data going back to 2001. And I started having the conversation with the people involved there saying, really, what, what are you exactly gonna do if somebody owes us money from 2001? 
Uh, and that the CEO is very much a proponent of shrinking our data to exactly what is necessary to get it done. And that helps with all of this. It helps reduce your risk. It makes a lot of things a lot simpler. Uh, but it's balancing that balancing act of how to have enough information to get the job done on a regular basis and not having too much information that becomes a swamp. And have you guys seen with, you know, making sure that, that people are using, you know, the, the right data, you're enabling that, that um, responsibility of, of, of the data usage. Do they see that as creating a roadblock when it comes to, you know, overall kind of data sharing or, or data democratization goals? Well, I think it's very important um, to, you know, from a data sharing perspective that we make sure that we have, you know, well-defined data sets to be shared, right? And they're coming from, you know, the golden source or the authoritative source for that information. Um, they're reconciled, they're of high quality. Um, that's one of our next journeys that we're going to be taking from our program perspective is, you know, start to make sure that, you know, what is being used in reporting and analytics, which it is, you know, very good high quality data is reconciling to those golden sources or authoritative sources of information. Um, so then that way, if they are doing any sort of analytics or reporting or using it for decision making, you know, that they can trust and have confidence in that information. Alongside of making sure that sharing between um, systems as well, um, you know, with um, our MDM system being more of a hub, uh, you know, where we're stewarding and governing the information, um, you know, to be sent to other systems that provide our services and products that, you know, that information as well is of high quality and um, accurate and complete. Excellent. Jay, I don't know if you have anything else to add, or I'm happy to, to move on to uh, the next topic here. I think we go on the next topic. Perfect. One of the things that I, I really liked out of this, this conversation, and again, what, what I'm hearing from customers that, that I'm talking to, um, is how imperative these initiatives are tied to business outcomes. Uh, I was at, a, again, I was at a CDO roundtable last week, and you know, someone mentioned that they've never seen a successful data initiative that was not tied to a business outcome. And I think that's absolutely accurate mm -hmm. uh, for these programs to go ahead and, and, and yield the adoption of which they're looking for. So overall, right, with the right capabilities, you're able to go ahead and reduce that complexity. You can solve multiple challenges and you're able to reduce those goals for greater productivity and efficiency. And again, those uh, improve business outcomes, such as customer experience or resource planning, being able to lower the risks, and then also being able to meet those overall um, policy and compliance goals within the organization. So what capabilities are missing today that are stopping you from achieving those goals? You know, when you're really kind of thinking about that, but, you know, what I, what I'm really curious about is, you know, when you're thinking about those capabilities that you're missing today, what are you really evolving to next in your data strategy, right? You, you, you both talked a lot about, you know, what you've been able to achieve so far, but when you look down uh, at 2023 and beyond, uh, what's, what's next and, and what capabilities do you need in order to get there? I can speak to that because we are you know, uh, laying out our roadmap as a team right now. So, um, the next, the near term next is data cataloging. We need to kind of, in order to manage our data effectively, we need to understand where our data is um, and uh, making sure it's of the high quality. Then our next uh, uh, thing that we're going to be doing is enabling data quality as well. We currently have existing technologies that do a great job, but that's not very scalable. So we're going to be leveraging um, um, Informatica's data quality capabilities on that. Um, also, uh, next we're going to be looking into is reference data management. Um, that's another tenant to improve data quality to making sure that everyone leverages enterprise versions of reference data. I think somebody had mentioned earlier about like country and country codes. <laughs> um, yep. That's something that, you know, um, when you're doing a master data management project, you uncover really quick if people are using standardized country codes. 
<laughs> or if they have two versions of uh, Great Britain and they have a Great Britain and a United Kingdom in a single uh, data set for a single data element. So um, that's where we, we see our, our next phase for this year and into next year. Um, reference data management is very critical and key for us to keep, um, you know, our um, high data quality to for our services that we offer um, and, you know, along with master data as well. For us, a lot of the pieces that we have to work on is come down to the data sharing as well as, uh, and this is the challenge of my side, is to <laughs> funnel the expectations of the business so that we don't try to eat the whole elephant all at the same time. Um, and that's not a technical piece that I need, but it's one of the things that is interesting within my organization because as we look at uh, the digital transformation overall, I just got a note from the CFO who asked me to say, stop all the other initiatives. We want to spend this year cleaning our data and having the highest data quality so we can all move to SAP next year. And I'm, I'm right now looking at my note and saying, okay, how do I tell him what is possible and what isn't possible? But in the normal scheme of things, for us, a lot of the work has to be done with how we do the data sharing across those organizations, how we use um, our, our uh, uh, the catalog more effectively. Originally, we decided to start with data catalog mainly because I thought I could build this over time as we have new analytical and new data projects and start getting that all populated. But now data quality is taking a forefront on something that I have to solve. But as I'm doing that, more of some of the integration side of things is also becoming very, very important. For us, everything's getting towards how can we get that AI and ML capability as fast as possible. The trick I need to do and work with it again is more of my side than anybody else's is training or getting the business to understand and to focus so that, hey, we can do this work in the AI and ML space. We can get the data quality where you need it to be, but pick one area of it and let's go do what's necessary from a cataloging perspective, a quality perspective, get the lineage in place so people can trust it, get data marketplace working so people can extract and get the data that they need to do and make those all work together, even on that smaller, uh, piece because we take all those smaller pieces, add it up, and now we got something worth talking about. Yeah, and I think that's that's great. How are how are you seeing as as you're starting to build out um, you know the data strategy, Terry talked about uh, you know the, the roadmap. Um, are there new lines of businesses in which you're looking to align to as as well in um, this coming year or in this year? Yeah, absolutely. So from a master data management perspective, we started with the B2B and I kind of keep referring to what we call the lifecycle client services, where we kind of focused on key pieces of that life cycle that would give us the biggest bang for our buck as the first, um, um, you know, uh, rollout. So what we're also doing this year is expanding in our master data management space to go across that entire life cycle at the starting point of leads and opportunities. We have technologies like Salesforce that do that to contracts to, um, you know, uh, and then, you know, to all the way to billing, which we've already been doing with this uh, current uh, deployment and initiative. Then we're also going down to the B2C level um, you know, to help support initially, you know, those individuals that we, we provide services to. Um, but I didn't want to bring it up because Jay seems like this is one of his hot topics. Um, what's been asked of us next is how do we kind of standardize uh, people in their access management? Mm -hmm. Not that MDM is going to be the access management tool, but to be able to kind of have that central point of access management across our systems as well. So, um, uh, so that's, you know, one of our other things that are on is on the radar. But the great thing is, is that from a technology perspective, this technology is fairly agile. We just have to make sure that, you know, the capabilities as it offer, that it does offer, it's the right solution for the business needs as well. Yeah, and that makes sense. And, and you know, Jay, earlier you mentioned, you know, kind of on the collaboration piece, right? When they're when they're ready and they're and they're willing. So 
Are you seeing more people now in 2023 at uh, Valmont now wanting to come in to uh, to participate? Absolutely. In fact, I have to speed. I have to beat them off with a stick at this point in time, only because I can't. I can't do as much as they want us to do. Uh, but that's where the focus comes important. And and back to the point that we made earlier on the uh, business impact and doing things that fit within the model of what's going to be most impactful to the business. But yes, we're as people are seeing and seeing the successes we're having, uh, even in little scopes that we've been working at. Uh, more and more people are finally saying, aha, they understand it. And even things like cataloging where they were at first, why do I have to fill this out? I know what it is. When we go and do it, and then they realize, I'm never going to have to answer this question again. I'm only going to have to change this when it changes. Uh, it becomes aha, because a lot of the questions we're asking today, we asked three years ago. Uh, and now, mm -hmm. okay, so now we got one place for everyone to see it across the life cycle and across from everywhere from the data scientists all the way up to those leaders and managers. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that you brought in, you know, the, the same questions are being asked today as they were three years ago. And that made me think of the slide that, um, you know, Jason spoke about, um, you know, earlier in, in, um, in this webinar. Right. And those are questions that we're commonly seeing. Again, those are questions that we're still hearing, you know, three, four years later uh, from customers. And I don't think those questions are necessarily going to change. It's more of the how do we go ahead and, and get those questions answered and, and what what capabilities do we have in order to help um, speed that up? So. I want to go ahead and, uh, and and wrap this up as as we're coming to uh, time and just kind of put a little bit of uh, you know what is Informatica's you know point of view on this and, and how do you go about being able to solve this and and we believe that you need a differentiated set of capabilities that are going to go ahead and help to accelerate this data journey and this includes a solution that has AI at its core right being able to drive AI powered recommendations and automation to help to accelerate that data acquisition across your organization it's going to be, it needs to be a solution that's going to empower all of the users it's going to cater to all those different personas within the organization so least technical user to most technical user um, to to be able to support that um, and finally a solution that's going to be able to scale with your business so um, we talked about you know what's what's next on the horizon uh, for for both Jay and and, and Taryn and, and you know she mentioned you know data cataloging so with a platform that you can go ahead and have different levers uh, to push and pull on uh, as that program begins to mature and, and is is able to go ahead and scale um, as a part of that and we really see that uh, you know without these enterprise uh, platforms that can provide these you're really ending up to be forced into a disparate you know bespoke solution. Um, that's going to require endless amount of integration and maintenance and is going to go ahead and slow down that delivery of data quality to your users within the organization. I also want to put a call to action here. So I'm going to leave this up here for a second because we have a QR code uh, that's on here that you're able to scan. We have Informatica World that's coming up in May. I can't believe we're, we're already there, but uh, May 8th through uh, 11th, uh, Informatica World in Las Vegas. Um, we're also going to have Taryn and Jay joining us there, so you'll be able to see Taryn's panel on how to reckon or how to achieve rapid and tangible results. And Jay is also going to be hosting a customer breakout and the data strategy and trends track. So really exciting! I'm sure those are going to go ahead and fill up quickly as registration has already uh, begun. Lastly. Uh, Informatica, we just came out with our um, CDO survey. So again, there's a QR code on here, but I'll leave it up there for you to be able to uh, download. Um, but our CDO Insights 23 survey, this is going to cover some of the challenges that we talked about today, as well as how data strategy is evolving. So uh, with that, we are at, at time. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Taryn and I want to thank Jay for joining us today. Um, it's been great. Really appreciated the uh, interactive conversation and um, just the thought leadership that each one of you have brought into uh, the conversation. 
Um, Jason, also thank you for helping to um, co-host this. Uh, with I really appreciated hearing things around your background and things that you're seeing through the advisory services part of Informatica as you're working with uh, with customers. And for all of you who who attended today, I uh, really hope that you guys were able to pick up a few good tips. We're, we're absolutely happy to continue this conversation in any shape or form. And you can go ahead and reach us on um, social media um, or catch our uh, YouTube videos um, that are out there um, discussing this. So with that, again, thank you to each and every one of you who have taken time out of your schedules to join us today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you, everyone, for that uh, great presentation. And um, I think there are just a couple of Q&A uh, questions, if you have time, Ryan and Jason. Um, one from Hamid is, do you coordinate with the Azure Peer Review Catalog? I'm sorry, would you be able to uh, repeat that again? Sure. Do you coordinate with the Azure Preview, Purview Catalog? Uh, so do we integrate with uh, Azure uh, Purview? Uh, yeah. No, we do not. Okay. Um, and I think that is, apologies, I think that is the only question left in the Q&A. Um, thank you everyone for attending. That's all we have time for. Uh, just to remind everyone, the recordings will be posted on dataversity.net along with the slides from this presentation within two business days. And Shannon will send out a follow-up email to let you know of this and also with any other links or requested information. Thank you again for to Informatica for sponsoring today's webinar and thank you to everyone who attended. Hope you all have a great day. Until next time. Thank you. Have a good time.